Okay, I just kind of want to wing a video here to kind of cover a bunch of genre. For, first of all, I think Corey and I are, are speaking past one another, which, which is fine. Um, and I, I, I think that there's something about the free play of signs and seeing... Um, I, think, I think people are very, very caught up inside of uh, the internality of language. I personally see... Uh, a segment, a large segment of languages being uh, objective, uh, like the scratch, like the glyph. And <clears throat> certain authors, excuse me, I'm getting over a cold, uh, certain authors are going to promote the idea of uh, uh, our relationship to a system of our auditory abilities as taking primacy uh, over our visual um, or our olfactory, or our sense of touch, our five senses, so to speak. Um, and I don't know, I'm a, I'm a sixth sense person in that I, I think that one can extrapolate and construe and invent uh, and bond with uh, imaginary uh, ideas and ideals, um, so to speak, uh, kind of like... Oh, I wish I had a puzzle here. But anyway, um, I don't know what to say about that. I, I thought B2 Cyrus made a comment on my video. How do you get out of your internal monologue? I think that's impossible. There, There is a, a fracturing process. It's like a, a rebooting your, your hard drive, and it presses uh, all symbolism. Um, uh, and, and maybe I need to do a series of videos on how to break one's uh, egonic belt, is what I like to call it. Uh, first, though, uh, and I'm going to link a video right here to um, another video where I'm discussing um, what I had, uh, in, in terms of um, what it means to supplement uh, the, uh, the, the language for uh, sound for, uh, how to put it, supplement the ears for the eyes, uh, supplement the uh, eyes for the mouth. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and link that there. It's a previous video that I have. Um, <clears throat> I, th there's a point of contention when... Or I shouldn't say a point of contention. Uh, God, what, how to put this? Uh, the, yeah, the logos as divine, as Corey puts it. Uh, the tunis. Uh, tunis is something that we find meaning, meaningful, but there's not tunis by necessity. Uh, Tunis by necessity is found through observation, it's found through the eyes, but the transcendent to-ness is the divine logos, and so I'm not always stuck on that which is divine. I don't always try to promote it or expand my vision in some Eckhart Tolle, uh, some Alan Watts sort of approach, although I allow this kind of uh, ontological... Uh, uh, bloating, inflation, um, inflationary talk, I think, I think it's got its limits, but then <clears throat> you'll hear Corey say, well, look, a two doesn't exist in time and space, and then this brings everything back over into the observable realm, into the idea of, of observation. So, you know, I, uh, uh, <laughs> oh, okay, here we go. So, so, in, in being a visual artist, I, I think that there's so much about what it means to speak, which is another system, right? So, I bring out my old stopwatch here in my, my tape, right? You know, I stopwatch, and, uh, and I start in my, my tape measure there, and I take my two, and I, I start timing it right. Oop. Okay. What did that mean? What did that mean for me to... Uh, uh, drag a number two, whoops, a number two uh, across the field. Is there any meaning? Meaning, can you look at that, you know, like listening to music, five, number five, five, can you look at that and not see your cultural boundedness to the meaning of such a thing? You know what I'm saying? Uh, can you do that? Can one... Can one do that? Is there anything that we can mention that should be rooted and specifically granted 
to uh, the observation field of language because these two fonts uh, not only come from different legacies, uh, they, you know, fonts are, are invented all the time, uh, but uh, older fonts uh, are bound and older symbols that are associated with certain fonts are bound to certain particular histories, right? And these can, you know, this can become a type of alchemy, if you will. But even the temperature, the color, the color, now color does not come across with, with words, right? With tone, with, with the auditory field. So fonts don't come across with the auditory field. Um, temperature does not come across with the auditory field. Um, these are, yeah, these are different systems that are all part of the same. This is why the notion of feral children, uh, this is the notion of pre-linguistics, check out the video link I posted, uh, the, the, the notion of where uh, one field has a specific, uh, you know, kind of like uh, art, uh, somebody made a claim like art always comes a uh, you know, leads philosophy by 50 years, and other people, oh, no, 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 philosophy leads art by 50 years or five years or whatnot. And um, I think the fight here is between the different, you know, the different aspects of how it is we hear language, what, where one takes off, where one doesn't take off, uh, or where another doesn't take off. And so what I'm suggesting is this, is that, is that, uh, Corey Anton's approach, where he is not dogmatic, where he thinks he's ambiguous, is in the distinction uh, of one taking primacy over another. Let's look at language like this. And then I critique his reading list very much like a promotion of a particular font. And I'm saying, look, your font is not different in its fontness from religions. Right? I'm trying to suggest that the fontness, the collaboration, the internality, uh, the inward <clears throat> ability of the point, the pointing inwardness is itself uh, kind of, uh, it, it, it's by, by generating a delineation, we have that denoted, but it, you know, if it becomes static, then, then exception is going to, uh, it's going to become obvious. It's going to obviate itself, um, not to take obvious and obvu, uh, ovulation and put them together. But um, the whole idea is what, what is it that uh, Helen Keller uh, came, came to learn uh, without sight, without sound? What did she learn with just her hands? How did she become so political? How did she make that leap without sight, without sound? How is it that we are so bounded to... Uh, a movie track, if you had to choose to have your eyes poked out or your ears poked out, what would be the difference in how these, these whole types of communities live? What would it mean to have a whole population of deaf people breed over here and a whole population of sightless people to breed over here? What would it mean to have, there, there are people that live on all fours, right? They live on all fours, they try to stand up. Uh, I will search for a video and see if I can put a link in. There's people that are feral, there are feral people in the world. Um, then, so what it is we are, what it is we are as a culture, how it is we are put together now as a group, right, as this technological group. I mean, my friends, some of them won't get on Facebook, they won't get online, they don't want anything to do with it. They're trying their best to stay away from this grouping, this manifestation, this bonding with technology. And then what does it mean to live and live a good life within this? And what does it mean to be within the structure itself? Does this very structure not plow over? Does it not swoop over and try to predominate over different civilizations? can care not exist, you know, and then Gary gets on, he makes a comment, um, and it's more, you know, it's more like, look, we're going to slash and burn the extremities that are, are not going along with the flow here. Bark Lord made a video like, hey, I think Africans should agree with, you know, with, you know, basically agree with what we're doing or sympathize with the Western process. I, I, I wish we'd stay out of their business. I wish we would stop all of our input. I wish our science wouldn't try to leak in and reach into primitive areas. I, I just really hope it doesn't, but it is.